when I lecture, I believe this is 18, or it could be 17, I'm not really sure. We will be going over one more related rates problem, which I thought was kind of difficult. And that was number 37 on page 189. And basically, here was the system. And somebody who knows things about like motors and robotics and stuff like that, please feel free to, um, to interrupt with informed commentary. But my understanding of this is only theoretical. But there's some kind of a system in which there's a rod attached to some kind of like a piston or something. And my, this, this is kind of the picture in the book. And uh, now we'll read some words. What it says is that the endpoints of a movable rod of length one meter, this is the movable rod right here of length one meter, the endpoints um, are attached uh, at point x comma zero and y comma zero. All right, I'm not a big fan of this because it means that they're doing the thinking for you, in my opinion. But what they've essentially said is um, establish a coordinate system in which this is zero zero, this is x zero, and this is zero y. That's built into the picture in the book. Thus, this quantity is x and this quantity is y. Um, the position of the end of the rod on the x-axis is that x of t is one-half sine pi t over 6. Oh. Uh, and the task is find the time of one complete cycle of the rod, what's the lowest point, blah, 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 blah. Okay, what, so what is actually going on here? Well, I'm given, what makes this problem kind of interesting and different is, I'm given an explicit function for the position uh, over time of the x coordinate. In other words, it kind of, I'm adding my own sort of backstory into this, but it seems as if I know exactly at any, at any given moment uh, where the x coordinate is going to be. That might be because this is the um, object which is like, this is like the, I'm using all the wrong words. I don't actually actually know what a piston is. This is the problem. I'm trying to explain the story. But what is a piston exactly? Can I get a definition of a piston? It's just a thing that moves, right? It's distinct from like the motor, or the motor refers to the entire system, including the piston. The motor is like a thing that spins. The motor is like a thing that turns. Okay. So this this is a piston essentially, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So a piston is a thing that moves. Never mind what's moving it. But somehow there is something going on which is moving this piston back and forth. Okay, well, as this is moving, as since it is attached to this rod, this other piston is going to go up and down. And so actually what we're seeing here is a system in which we can make horizontal motion via this rod uh, translate, we can translate this horizontal motion into vertical motion. Is everyone sort of seeing the picture happening here? So there are all kinds of times when you might want to do this. Do you have a time when you might want to do this? All you like pre-engineers, when might you want to translate? motion in one direction or another. I don't know. I actually don't know. If you think of something, let me know. Okay. Uh, so. Alistair leaving? So he doesn't have to sit in the trunk? I think she's being silly, but I don't know. Okay, bye, Alice. Win the race. Good. Um, good. Good. So, first, um, now the preparatory questions. All right, so. Um, I have read and understood the question, I think. I have drawn a picture. I've picked variables for the quantities which are changing. It is, in fact, variables x and y which will be changing over time. Added those variables to my picture. Let's answer these questions. Part A and Part B are designed to just simply get you comfortable with the geometry of the situation. And Part A says, find the time of one complete cycle of the rod. Well, you're supposed to just be an expert on pre-calculus and look at this function and know that the period of this function is 12. So the answer is that every 12 seconds, this entire system is going to repeat. Is everybody cool with that? And if you look at it a little bit more carefully, at time zero, sine of zero is zero. And so I'm going to be here at time zero. Um, and then if it takes 12 seconds, that means after three seconds, it's going to be at its maximum, which is one half. After three more seconds, it's going to be back at zero. This, this is just based on my knowledge of how the sine function works. After nine seconds, it's going to be over here. After 12 seconds, it's going to be back here. And then it's just going to keep repeating that over and over again. Is everyone cool with that? All right. 
Uh, part B says, what is the lowest point reached by the end of the rod on the y-axis? Okay, well, as this is of length 1 and is not changing, I have to look at this function and realize that the amplitude of this function is 1 half. Since the amplitude of this function is 1 half, the farthest out x will ever get is 1 half. So the lowest the y point is ever going to be is when the x point is all the way out, right? So when this is all the way out at 1 half, I have like a kind of, you know, 1 half, 1 situation. So that must be root 3 over 2. Pretty cool with that? So this y is not changing very much. It's, it's going from root 3 over 2, which is 0.866, to 1. And it's just going up and down over that relatively small interval. Everyone's still with me? All right. So the answer is the lowest that the y coordinate ever gets is at root 3 over 2, and that's going to happen at time 3 seconds. All right, now we get to the real question, part C. Yes, Yael? I thought that um, the lowest point of the y-coordinate is when um, x is 0, because then it's like... Lower no, look at the picture. When x is 0, the yeah. rod right. will be straight up in the oh, air. Oh, that one's x moving, is zero. Yep. yep, when x is 0, y is 1. Again, these first two questions were just to get you to really like engage with the picture and understand what's going on. Okay, now we're ready to do the real thing. Find the speed of the y-axis endpoint when the x-axis endpoint is one fourth comma zero. All right, so it seems as if what they want is dy dt, and they want dy dt specifically um, when x equals one fourth. This is what is going on in part C. This is what we want. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, we need to seek a relationship between the variables, and I think the relationship between the variables is pretty obvious x squared plus y squared equals 1. All right, differentiate both sides with respect to t. I get 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 0. And then I can solve for dy dt. What is dy dt? It's same old, same old. Algebraize, cancel the 2s. It's going to be negative x dx dt over y. All right, but now, when I go to actually evaluate this, unlike all the previous problems we've done, dx dt is not a constant. Um, dx dt is determined by this function, which I have explicit sort of access to. All right, so uh, this is my formula in general for the relationship between x, y, dx dt, and dy dt. But what I really want is, as we just mentioned, what I really want is dy dt at x equals 1 quarter. Okay. So, well, what is that? It's going to be according to my formula, whatever x is, when x is 1 quarter, which is a fourth, uh, times whatever dx dt is when x is 1 quarter. So I'm not sure what that is yet, so I'm just going to write that as dx dt when x is 1 quarter. And I'll go back and try to figure out what that is. And then all over uh, y. Um, and what is y when x is 1 quarter? Well, for that, I will make an auxiliary picture. And I think we talked about this in class, right? The cool way to do this is to say, all right, if x is 1 quarter, in your mind, you say, this is a quarter. So, and that's, um, well, basically, you call, you scale the, scale the, this is 1, right? This is a quarter, this is 1. So if you scale the figure by 4, this is really like a 1, 4, something right triangle. And then what is that something? Kind of just do it in your head. Careful. If this is one. If this is one and this is four, then what's the missing side? Root fifteen. Yeah. Root fifteen. And so now I now shrink the triangle back down by a factor of four, and it's root fifteen over four. That's how you just kind of like do Pythagorean theorems in your head with really fast. Follow? More or less? Okay. So this is a root 15 over 4. Um, all right. So the hard part, however, is figuring out what dx dt is when x is 1 quarter. Now, it's tempting to just take the derivative of this function because, after all, if I have the function, I can just take the derivative, right? So what is dx dt? Well, dx dt, is just, I'll just differentiate now, is going to be 1 half times the derivative of sine of something is cosine of something back inside for the derivative of the something. Okay. 
Well, that is a formula for dx dt, but it's a formula for dx dt in terms of t, not in terms of x. So I'm no closer, well I am closer, but I'm still not ready yet to answer the question, what is dx dt when x is one quarter? How can I figure that out? Substitute x for t. Just forget about the t and just put x in there? No, like solve the Fine. equation for t, like x equals one half sine pi t over six. Can you like solve that for t? Yeah, in fact, that's exactly what you have to do. Um, basically, what Laura is saying is, well, if this is a formula which gives me the x coordinate for a given t, and this is a formula which will give me the, the, the rate of change of x for any given time, and what I need to know in order to compute the x dt when x is 1 fourth, I need to know at what time is x equal to 1 fourth, right? At what time t is x equal to 1 fourth. If I can solve that equation, then I can just plug it in. Is this, this is the hard step. All right, so um, if you get that good, if not, is everyone cool with that question? Okay. So now I just do it. When x is 1 fourth, I'm basically just setting my equation um, equal to 1 fourth and solving, let's see, this is saying sine pi over 6 uh, t equals 1 half. Yeah. So when is sine of something equal to 1 half? Well, that is going to happen when the something is pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. And the nice thing is about this problem is they, keep, they use the word speed because they don't have to worry about crap like velocity and signs and stuff like that. I can just do the problem like normal. So when is this going to happen? This is going to happen multiplying both sides by 6 over pi. So you happen at t with 1 and 5. Uh, and then like, you know, plus 12k, but who cares about that? Um, all right, so the conclusion of this, of this algebraic step is that it is at time 1 and time 5 that my x coordinate is 1 fourth. And that passes the common sense test, because after all, we said I'm here at time 0, and I'm out here at time 3, right? So it seems like at time, about time 1 second, I should be at about a fourth. That seems reasonable. And then here I am at, here I am at 0, here I am at 3, and then by the, by the time I get to x equals 6, I'm, or t equals 6, I'm back here again. So it seems to be correct that I'm passing through at 1 and 5. All right, now that I've done that, I can compute the x t when x is 1 quarter by plugging in either 1 or 5, it doesn't matter, into this formula. And so we get 1 half times cosine pi over 6 uh, times pi over 6. And cosine pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. It's 1 half times root 3 over 2 times pi over 6. So we get this sort of ugly formula, root pi root 3 over 24. And now finally, I can plug that in here, because that is the x dt when x is 1 fourth. So the final answer is, let's see, the 1 fourths cancel, so it's going to be, and the negative I'm just going to blow it off because whatever, so it's going to be pi root 3 over root 15 times 24, and you can even cancel the root 3 from the top and bottom. So final, final answer, pi over 24 root 5, and the units are like meters per second. For any of you got that problem like more or less all by yourself prior to this class? One, two, three, sure four. What Yo. T equals five. Um, I ignore the t equals five case because um, okay, okay. I should I should test five also, but I kind of know because the symmetry of the situation is just going to be the same thing. If I plug in five here, I get cosine five pi over six, which is negative root three over two. So it's the same speed, right? It just is just a negative in there. But since it's asking about speed, not velocity, I'm just throwing away all negatives at whenever they appear, and not worrying about them. All right. Uh, okay, good. I now pronounce you experts on related rates. What about... I have... What? Problems. Problems. What are the problems? Um, number... Oh, from the new section, you mean? Yeah, I thought that's what we were Oh, yeah, yeah, that is about... That is what we're about to do now. Yeah, which one? Um, uh, number 42. Other people too can chime in. Chiming in, any of you? Nope. 
No, that's it? No, we're going to definitely do more than those. Um, 28, maybe, should we do? Even though maybe it's not hard. Um, and how about, how about, how about, how about, how about, let's do another one. 269. Which one? 79? What's 79? Well, that's just kind of like a, like a, like a thinky problem. How about 16? 16? Uh, yeah. We should do 16 also. That seems pretty good, right? Maybe even 13. That's not that hard. All right, I'm going to do these five. Um, give me one second. Arun, you're going to do some work. Okay. straight up problem that says, yo, figure out where this function is increasing and where it is decreasing. The function is x root 16 minus x squared, and so we just do it. Um, so first I will rewrite this function as x 16 minus x squared to the 1 half. Um, so that I don't mess up when I take the derivative, and I need to differentiate. Um, also, did you guys, I made a little note on that line about how I really hate what our book does. Um, our book, like many calculus textbooks and many calculus teachers, um, does not have faith in you guys that you actually know your pre-calculus, and so it does that terrible like test points thing where it just keeps telling you to like, plug a point in. I hate that. If you are good with factoring and algebra, you can always just factor your derivative and make it pretty, and this is sort of like the pro way to do this. So all right, for example, um, I go to differentiate this now and watch what happens. Everything's beautiful if you kind of do it my way. So derivative of the first uh, times the second. So you get 16 minus x squared to the 1 half. Uh, plus, I'm using a product rule now, the first times the derivative of the second. And the derivative of the second is 1 half, 16 minus x squared to the negative 1 half back inside negative 2x. Alright, so being very neat and careful with our work, uh, it turns out that I have negative x squared, 16 minus x squared to the negative 1 half. Alright, and now all that practice like quote unquote simplifying derivatives is coming into play here. I don't just want to know when this derivative is zero, I want to know when it's positive and negative. So resist the temptation to like set this equal to zero and solve, that's like the lame way to do it. We want to just keep simplifying it until it's like in a factored form. So have we talked about this in this class? I hope we have. But the whole factor out the lowest power thing? Yeah. OK, good. So now is where you use that. And I know it's weird at first, or it can be, but you will get comfortable with it the more you do it. So we're going to, let's see, we're going to factor out um, some power of 16 minus x squared. Which power? Negative negative the, always the lower one, the negative 1 half. And if I factor that up to the negative 1 half, then I'm left with uh, by exponent rules, this has to be a 16 minus x squared to the to the 1. Because mm -hmm. something to the negative 1 half times something to the 1 is something to the 1 half. And then as I've already taken that out, I'm just left with this. So this is like the beautiful, excellent, awesome way of getting rid of all these things without descending into a nightmare of fractions and radicals and stuff like that. Uh, this is now quite simple. It is just 16 minus 2x squared 
uh, over root 16 minus x squared. And I could now, I'll factor out a negative 2. And if I factor out a negative 2, I'm left with x squared minus 8 um, over root 16 minus x squared. And I could even write this as negative 2 x minus 2 root 2 x plus 2 root 2. All right, this is a beautiful, beautiful factor derivative, which I'm now in total control of uh, when it comes to figuring out um, where this thing is positive and where this thing is negative. First of all, I might note that the domain of this function is everything from negative 4 to 4 only. Um, and so now to answer the actual question, where is it increasing, where is it decreasing, I'm going to make a sign chart. The denominator is always positive, so it can be ignored for sign chart. Bless you. For sign chart purposes, I will go only from negative 4 to 4, because that's the only thing I can do. And then what are the relevant uh, places where the derivative changes sign? At negative 2 root 2 and at 2 root 2. Um, and as, as I'm ignoring the denominator, because it's, it's always positive, it's only the numerator that's relevant. And the numerator is basically a, quad it is a quadratic, in fact. It's a quadratic with roots here and here. And since the leading coefficient is negative, that means the end behavior is like this, right? So I can say for sure that this is like that. Bam. Perfect, beautiful, wonderful, excellent. Uh, and then, thus, I can say that this is decreasing on the interval negative 4 to negative 2 root 2. It's increasing on negative 2 root 2 to 2 root 2. And it is decreasing on the interval 2 root 2 to 4. All right, is this is how you guys basically did this already? Okay. This is considered very hard by most calculus teachers. Um, they would pay millions of dollars to have students with the pre calc skills that you guys have, believe it or not. All right, um, that was a compliment. All right, uh, 13, we do more, 16. Going a little faster now. Um, oh, yeah, 16 is also hard and also requires some pretty good pretty high level of pre-calculus skills. I think I did this problem in one of the other classes. Cosine squared x minus cosine x, and we're trying to do this on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. All right, the calculus step is, is more or less trivial. It's the pre-calculus like, yes? Who, you? Yeah. Um, so, what is the derivative of this function? The derivative of cosine, this is really like cosine squared, so it's going to be 2 cosine x back inside for the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, and then minus the derivative of cosine, which is again negative sine. Did I do that right? Yeah. Two cosines. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, and now what seems like the smart thing to do? Factor out a negative sine. Factor out a negative sine, or maybe I could just factor out a regular sine. Because this is, this is negative two sine x cosine x plus sine x. I don't know what's easier. I guess it doesn't really matter. I'll just factor out, I'll just factor out a regular sign. So if I factor out sine, I'm left with 1 minus 2 cosine x. Okay, so again, resist the temptation to solve for 0. Instead, um, instead uh, just factor it. All right, and now... Uh, I have, now we do that thing that we did like one of those, there was one of those days, Magna remember in pre-calc C, there was one of those days where I taught you this kind of like strategy. It was a relatively advanced strategy on how to figure out when this kind of product of two trig functions is positive and negative. Give me some vague nod if you have some vague memory of this. Remember how we did this? Yeah, you put them each on a separate circle and then you combine them together. So yeah, I need to know when the product of these two expressions is positive, and thus I need to know when each of them is positive and negative. And so I'm going to set up two, I'm going to make a picture of when sine x is positive, and I'm going to make a picture of when 1 minus 2 cosine x is positive. And I'm going to solve each of these separately via picture. So when is sine positive? Okay, well I'd make a little unit circle, sine is the y coordinate, so of course sine is going to be positive here. Um, when is 1 minus 2 cosine x positive? Being very careful about this, it's going to be true whenever 1 is bigger than 2 cosine x. So that's going to happen whenever this is true, right? 
So it's whenever cosine x is less than half. All right. So I make a picture of when cosine x is less than half. And cosine is the x coordinate, so cosine is a half here and here. So it's going to be less than half all of these places. OK. And now what I'm really interested in is not when this is positive individually and when this is positive individually, but when the product is positive and negative. So we create a super picture. Uh, we basically just superimpose the two figures. So we have like a double concentric sh circle shading action. Again, this idea is due to some student a long time ago. And I've been doing it that way ever since. Um, so this enables me to, at a glance, look at the circle and determine um, when this derivative is positive and negative. Okay, so I'm going to make a sign chart for my derivative, but I'm only going to do that on the interval from 0 to 2 pi because uh, I'm only being asked about this function on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And what are the places where the thing changes sign? Well, that is going to happen, I guess, at pi over 3. Um, something interesting is going to happen at pi. And something interesting is going to happen at 5 pi over 3. And if you've done all this very neatly and carefully and logically, then it's a simple matter of looking at it and just interpreting your circle. So between 0 and pi over 3, one of my circles is shaded, but the other one isn't. And by convention, I shade when they're positive. So on this interval, that means one's positive and one's negative. Thus, the product is negative. You guys remember this whole thing that we did? Yeah, this is pretty much, this is like the main time when you need that skill. Okay, and then between pi over 3 and pi, they're both shaded. That means they're both positive. That means the product is positive. From pi to 5 pi over 3, one's shaded and one isn't. So that means one's positive and one's negative, so the product is negative. And from 5 pi over 3 to 2 pi, neither is shaded, which means that these are each negative, but that means that their product is positive. So this is, in my opinion, the most efficient way of, um, of, of doing this problem. Yes? So I didn't draw this to the but I still have the right answer. So okay, yeah. There's, I mean, this is there's not only this is this is like a this is like a controversial thing in the like math teacher world because it's very difficult to teach students how to solve these problems. If you want to just cop out, which is fine, and just do it the book's way, the book the book says basically just pick test points, right? So what the book I think isn't this what the book tells you to do? I haven't reread it here, but I think I think the book just says, hey man, pick a number between zero and five over three, like I don't know five over four, plug it in and then just like crank that out and just see whether it's positive or negative. It's just kind of lame, but it works. Could you just like set equal to zero That's what the book wants you to do. The book wants you to set it equal to zero, figure out the places where it is zero, and then just use test points on each interval. Uses. Could you also just do it the, the way I did it? I just sort of did it the normal way, just in, without the circles. Because we know at those points, one of them is going to switch signs. Okay, yeah, so if you're very, very careful and very experienced and you're very confident that there are, there's going to be a sign change at each one of these, then you could get away with doing just one test point. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Kind of? yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. I didn't you go could, through on each thing. You could just do one test point and then just hope that you're smart enough to know that it's going to change at every point. But anyway, this is the quality, this is the quality way of doing it. Yes? Yeah, you could also kind of do it backwards. You could figure that's really weird, but yeah, you could do that. You could de you could determine whether the derivative is positive or negative by seeing whether the function is increasing or decreasing by taking like the first and last end of the. Okay, sure. What? Um, never even, never even mind. That was too weird to keep repeat. repeat. Okay, going faster. I'm um, gonna do these last three. This is not really a conceptual conversation we're having now. It's just like skills. We're just talking about skills at this point. Twenty-eight is this 
function f of x equals x to the two thirds of minus four. Is that correct? This is bird minus four. So how do we differentiate this? We just do it. Um, what you get is two thirds x to the negative one third, which I hastily rewrite in algebra friendly form as two over three cube root x. Okay. Well, that being my function, I think uh, I would like to know what the critical values are. And the critical value is clearly zero, right? It's yes. when x is zero, this function is undefined. Oh, yeah. So I make a sign chart for it, and yeah. it seems like the only relevant value is at zero. Well, I just look at this. I know that the cube root of something positive is positive, and the cube root of something negative is negative. And so that's Bam. pretty much it. Yeah, not so hard. Um, definitely better than some lame test point technique. But yeah. I didn't do a test point for that. I know. Good. That was 28? It was. Um, okay, two more. 42, 52. Um, 42. Oh, yeah. This is like a little kind of advanced problem. Yeah. 42 um, x arctan x. Yeah. All right, how are we going to do this guy? Well, we differentiate. Also, if someone could raise the board, that'd be awesome. Um, we differentiate, and we get the derivative of the first uh, times the second, so that's arctan uh, plus the first times the derivative of the second, and I just know that the derivative of arctan is 1 plus x squared. Um, okay. So, what I have is something that looks kind of like that. And I would like to know when this is zero, if ever. Um, well, all right. I guess here, I don't know, thoughts? Can you think of a number which is going to make this derivative zero? Zero. zero. Yeah, zero. <laughs> I mean, that's something made it work. Maybe, to, maybe what we need to do is just kind of like consider each of these functions one at a time, right? This denominator is always positive, so this term will be positive when x is positive and negative when x is negative. And this term, well, that's also kind of what arctan does, right? Arctan comes up and then does that. So arctan is also positive when x is positive and negative when x is negative. So there's only one time that this guy is zero. There's only one time this derivative is zero, and that's when x is zero. And in fact, by this conversation we've just had now, if x is positive, well, the arctan of something positive is positive. And this is also, this will also be positive when x is positive. Follow, following this here? Following here? So this is, so I can claim just from looking at it and talking it out that this derivative will always be positive when x is positive. And when x is negative, arctan will be negative, and this term will be negative. So I made the sign chart there, but just kind of knowing things. Not by knowing things. Okay, last one. Um, this is like kind of a little bit more of the same, right? Um, oh, but I like this part because it's hard. Yes, um, 52 I know. says root 3 sine x, root 3 sine x plus cosine x. What were the directions? 